Welcome back everybody. So the front bumper build transitions into the custom two-piece engine side panel phase. The ones that go in conjunction with the side irons that we just recently completed. So we have the one-piece originals to use for contours and patterns and spacing, general shape. And then we have the one existing right-hand top portion left from my grandpa's old cat to give us all the critical details, fill in all the gaps, help us know how to size everything and what not. Once again, here's the breakdown view in the parts manual. You can see bottom half, which we're gonna be starting today, and then top half we'll be doing next time. And as long as we're in the neighborhood, might as well address the elephant in the room, that's right. I strategically had this old Mar Company wind-up caterpillar toy sitting in the background just to see if anybody would notice sure enough you guys did not disappoint so yeah it used to be used to be a wind up it's seen better days but you can see some of the spring in there the mechanism some gearing tracks are gone i believe this up top would have attached to maybe a dozer blade and some interesting detail on there it's got well, four injection lines and four push rods, and that would make it a D7 if we're really, you know, getting picky about it. But I think it was kind of modeled more to be a D8. But anyhow, this came from Mr. Crazy Dave 4455 on YouTube here. He's got a channel. Highly suggest you go check him out. Um, he's been documenting over the last year or so the family's departure from the old farm. I believe it was established in 1903, if I have all my facts right down by Rogers, Minnesota, and the uh, urban sprawl has just been coming in closer and closer, and finally they were surrounded on all sides, and they had to cease operations, and they found that when they were cleaning up one of the old buildings. He doesn't even know whose it was, maybe his grandfather's, how long it had been there, and that's really all that was left of it. And he asked me, do you want it? And I'm like, sure, I've taken on <laughs> worse loss causes. So uh, just kind of an interesting item and just some neat, history behind that just one of those relics from days gone by so thanks dave um i'll throw a link to his channel down below like i said i highly suggest everybody go check him out um real interesting stuff going on there so back to the build so we're starting with 14 gauge sheet steel that is what the originals are made from so we're just replicating everything exactly as the originals were just like we did with those side irons up to this point and another question i got from well i've got from a few viewers now they are wondering how thick of material i make my fold over locks out of and it depends because not all fold over locks are the same some are thicker some are thinner depending on application so i highly suggest everyone gets a gauge wheel all right these are really handy they only cost a few dollars and the slots all have the gauge numbers stamped by them so if you have a piece of steel and you're wondering what it is you just go find the one that lines in best with it and boom that tells you the gauge and on the reverse side is the decimal point thickness of the material very very handy so depending on your old lock you just get yourself a gauge wheel figure out what it is make it out of the corresponding thickness material so like i said this is 14 gauge we started with a four by eight sheet and the first thing i did was lop off a ten and a quarter inch wide chunk from one end and then we did all of our measurements and we decided how long and and short and tall and wide everything else needed to be draw all that out on there mark for our center bending line, and then we cut off the excess and we're left with a piece that looks just like that. So we need to put a 90, uh, 90 degree bend along that line. This is gonna be the bottom, this is gonna be the vertical top. You can see the big cutout section right here. That will clear the side bracket of the side iron. And yeah, you can tell there's gonna be a lot less in this area on the two-piece special ones than there was on the one-piece originals so this is just um i just cut these out with the cutoff wheel on the grinder you all have already watched me do that i'll probably clamp a chunk of angle iron along the side so i can initiate a really nice clean straight line because this is going to be finished material we'll get this one popped out and make it look like that and we'll move on to the bending okay with all the excess removed, those are 
the blanks. We've got right side, left side. So we can put the bend on each line. And for that, I built the world's strongest birdhouse. No, that's actually upside down. Um, we're gonna use the little 20 ton El Cheapo press. So I've got this piece of heavy half inch angle that is supported in both of the press blocks. And this is, well, basically a, a backwoods engineering press forming die. So this piece flips over and goes in that. And I've got this piece of heavy U-channel just tacked to the back of it to not only add rigidity down the entire run, but also give me a flat surface for the press to put pressure on. So we just need to square all this up with the table, square each one of these up on center line with the dies and apply pressure. We're all lined up, let's make a bend. Stop and check, make sure everything's still lined up. Let's see how we did. Bend ended up right where I wanted it. Good relief right there as we transition to the vertical. We stayed straight all the way down. It's good and square. Managed to work a good bend radius there. It's not too flat, it's not too sharp. It's looking just, pretty much just like the original. So we're good to this point. Let's do it again. I want to point out, I do grease these edges where the sheet is going to have to slide. It doesn't scar it up so bad that way. Set and loaded for round two. Let's do it again. I think we have the world's slowest punch press in action right here. Somebody call Guinness, we might have something. Looking good all around yet. All right, now that we have the rough shape of both of our right and left side, lower half engine side panels, it's time to start looking at all the cutouts we need to put in. So this one's gonna be pretty simple down here. We don't have to worry about the front, that's already been addressed. We just have this little bump in right here where it goes around where the mainspring T-bolt goes through the oil pan and the engine block. And that was so simple, I just measured that out and just cut that out already. So that's pretty much all we have to do for this left side panel. 
This right side panel, however, is going to be a lot more complicated. So not only do we have the bump in on the side for the drain plug that is on the crankcase breather, that oil separator, we need to address that. Plus we have, well, it cuts in here and then we have this jog here where the dipstick goes through and we have a hole beneath the oil filter for that housing drain and another hole beneath that crankcase breather. So both of these are two and a quarter diameter. So you can see I've got that one center punched where it needs to be, the other one center punched where it needs to be. They're not exactly in line. This one's a little higher than the other one. We measured it all out. So this cut in right here is an inch and a quarter wide. So what I'm gonna do, you can see I've got center marked or center punched for an inch and a quarter hole. We're gonna put the hole in there first. That gives us that nice radius. And then we'll just finish cutting everything else out on the lines. We also have the initial hole for that, that knockout or that bump in already marked. Um, this is kind of a chicken or the egg kind of scenario. I kind of want to get that put in before I put a bunch of holes in the bottom of this piece. But it's easier at least to put this hole in before that is in my way. So I got some thinking here. I need to decide how I want to attack this. Well, against my better judgment, I went ahead and cut everything out that needed to be cut out and contoured on the bottom. Even though my gut is telling me to leave as much of that intact as possible before I start working on that feature, I decided as long as I was at it, we're gonna go ahead and get it done. So it's all lining up, mirror image so far. So that means the next step is to form that bump in. That's, um, well, it's gonna be a little bit tricky. You can see I've put the initial hole in the side and, oh, coming off of behind the scenes episode number 83, I believe it was, we played around with our, um, the tools we made for whammo, knocking those in. So as I described there, looking at those two bump ends, I really doubted that the initial hole had a flat bottom and we got a flat top for the most part flat sides but to me even though that's highly stretched it just looks like it had an arc on the bottom to start with so or maybe it was punched out at the same time that they punched the the contour i don't know but we're starting with a hole that is two inches wide on the top and we're straight down five eighths on each side and then i centered out measured 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 down one inch and then made just kind of a gradual arc on the bottom. And when we did our initial test run on the behind the scenes episode with that, it seemed to come out pretty well. So of course that was on a piece of scrap metal. We didn't have to worry if something didn't work. So the reason I wanted to leave as much material as possible intact is because I need to use heat in conjunction with uh, some hammer blows to form that in. Like when they're stamping these out, if you catch the witness marks just right, you can see the top edge there and the top edge there of their backup die that supported that on the back side. And they have the advantage at the factory of just using tonnage and speed to go whammo and just blast those panels between two dies and you can pretty much turn them into whatever shape you want. I've got tonnage, but I don't have speed. And I've got whammo, but I don't have tonnage, so we're gonna have to use some heat to help stretch that metal. Hopefully we don't crack anything, and hopefully the heat is not excessive to the point that we put a buckle in our panel. So we're gonna gain some rigidity by still having that 90 degree bend. Let's see what happens. Hopefully you don't wreck it at this point, right?
now we let it cool off. All right, so it's a few minutes later. This thin metal doesn't take very long to cool off at all. And I have to admit, I'm pretty happy with that bump in. I took some sandpaper to the outside, kind of dressed it up a little bit, get rid of some of those heat marks. I left the inside the way it is because it's not so critical, but when you compare that, set it side by side with the other new one, you compare that, like the shape, the standoff, the overall look of the opening, you compare that to the factory original, I tell you what, we are pretty darn close. Everything is looking, I think, really good. We get a little bit of a paint surface covering on the front of that. You can tell by the back, almost looks better than the front because I haven't sandpapered it yet. But yeah, we've got some nice sharp contours on there, some good lines. And the backyard engineering forming dies, they work pretty well. This is your backup support back here. This pipe is perfect contour, hammering on top of that. And yeah, it, uh, it makes sure you only stretch the metal that you want stretched, leaves everything else alone. No ripples either. I was worried about the heat. That stayed pretty good down there. We're still nice and square down the bend radius. So we've established the rough form of each one. We've got all the proper contours matching the original. So that's gonna be about it for this episode. Next episode, we have some gusseting that we need to still put into these to reinforce those. And then we will be drilling mounting holes and doing all the fitting. So hopefully after that, we've got the bottom half of the two piece engine side panels done and we can start on the top halves. So this is time consuming, but boy, for me, it's fun. I, I just love making things out of, out of metal and out of tin like this and the tools and getting it all to take shape and trying to copy what they did with like actual real farming machines. I think it's fun. So hopefully it's as entertaining for you all as it is for me. I'm gonna wrap it right here. We need to start editing some video. So yeah, catch you again next time. We will continue on. Thanks everybody.